All right, so chapter four, part one. Now, uh, one thing that I need you guys to understand is that this is in two parts. They're about the equal parts, but it's all going to be one exam. It's not going to be two separate exams. I just did the notes in two different parts. Uh, this one is solution stoichiometry. The next one we get to will be reaction stoichiometry. So one of the main things about this is, number one, knowing solubility rules, which I assure you will always and forever be a part of this class. Number two is understanding um, diagrams and how to draw specific parts of solutions because that's particulate diagrams is a new way this is this class is heading as far as examination procedures so basic question this is solution stoichiometry what is a solution okay so this is a flow chart I know it's on there it's kind of hard to see um, but matter what is matter composed of and molecules very good so first question can it be separated by physical means now this part right here, uh, if you want to add this in, you can. But when we're talking about physical means, we're talking about um, filter. We're talking about distillation. Okay, we're talking about chromatography. Chromatography. Stuff like that. Okay. And I know some of you don't know what that means. You know what a filter is, right? Distillation is based on BP, which is what? <laughs> In chemistry, boiling point. Okay. Chromatography is based on um, polarity. Okay, That's what chromatography is based on. Um, but those are physical means. So if it can be separated by physical means, it's called a mixture. If it cannot, it is called a pure substance. So let's start on the right-hand side. Can it be decomposed by ordinary chemical means? And we're not going to get into any of that stuff. But if it can, be, if it can break down, um, it is a compound, which breaks down into its elements. If it can't be broken down any further, it is an element. But what happens if you can separate it physically, such as filter, distillation, chromatography, things of those nature? Uh, it's a mixture. Okay? And this word kind of throws people off. Because sometimes people can also say that it is, a, it is a solution. But when you hear the phrase solution, what image pops into your brain? <laughs> what state of matter? Let me ask it that way. A liquid, okay? Solutions don't necessarily... Seriously. Don't have to be liquids, but they can be. Because can you have a solution of gas? Are you breathing a solution of gas right now? You sure are, because is this stuff running around in this room more than one different thing? Yes, 70% of it's what? Nitrogen. We're not, the majority of what's in this room is not even what we need in our, in our body to, to survive. So, but is the uniform, compo is the uni composition uniform? Well, everything we see in here is, right? So we call that homogeneous, and if it's different, it's called heterogeneous. And so this is where solutions will fall into place. So don't just automatically mentally say, okay, a solution is a liquid, because can a solution be a gas? Yes, and this is even weirder. Can a solution be a solid? But we have special names for those things. What is that called? How many of you play in the band? Anybody play a brass instrument? What's that called? Very good. Okay, so alloys are metal solutions. Alloys. We just have a special name for them. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. They visibly look the same. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it is. We're homo sapiens. We're all the same people. Okay. So, solute, solute versus solvent. Okay. The ute is what you add. The vent does the breaking down. Okay. Now, uh, the solute is in the squat, smaller quantity. It is the thing that is dissolved, such as salt and salt water, sugar and soda drinks, carbon dioxide and, and soda drinks as well. And I know this one sounds kind of funky right here. How does this match this in terms of state of matter? What is carbon dioxide a state of matter? It's a gas, but soda per se is a... Is it possible to have a gas dissolved in a liquid? Yes, it's 
it's dissolved. It's, it's all based on something. So what happens if all that carbon dioxide left that soda? It's flat. Okay, so you already knew this. It's just looking at it from different terms. And the way and the reason it does this is because of pressure and due to polarity. We can actually pull it in. Okay, when you drink water, are there gases dissolved in that water? Oxygen is because if there was no oxygen in the water, what would all die? Fish. Somebody actually proposed this question to me in fourth period yesterday, and I said, that's a really good question. We were talking about water displacement, and they said, okay, what happened if you took a pond and you took all of the fish and animals out of the pond. It would go down, but how much? That's, but that's an interesting thought, right? Like, and he really, he said ocean. He said, if you took all the fish and whales and sharks out of the ocean, how much would the water go down? That is, like, that is a crazy question. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> is Do we have, are the currents really because of the fish swimming, or is it really because of the moon? Those are interesting questions. <laughs> Let's just drop a nuclear bomb in the ocean and kill it all and let them float to the top and let's see what happens. Uh, so, I mean, really, if you think about how much would, and, and I've never did one. When he asked that, I said, that is mind-blowing. He asked, if you took all of the fish out of the ocean, how much would the water level drop? It's a crazy question, right? <laughs> it's a crazy question. Yes. I mean, you, I mean you're talking about in the, in the nano, in the picometer scale. I would assume, yes. I, it, it was just something to think about, something to ponder. I don't know. Sorry. Okay. So uh, solvent, larger quantity. The sol uh, the solvent is being dissolved. Do me a favor, and I don't know if it's no, it's not. Add alcohol to the bottom of that, please. Uh, uh, the solvent under these sources: water and salt, and water and soda. Because there are some substances that the solvent is actually an alcohol. And I also want you to write non-polar solvents. The key here that we need to learn as a group is that the reason things dissolve in other things is this one phrase. And this will never earn you credit in an answer, so never write it. That like dissolves like. Now that's an elementary way to say it. But when we mean like, we're talking about the polarity. So if like dissolves like, then polar dissolves polar and non-polar dissolves Nonpolar. So if you take oil and water, we know water is polar, oil is non. They do not mix because of that reason. Okay. But if you take nonpolar substances such as fats and oils, will they dissolve into the grease? Think about this. If you take a French fry and you put it in a and you put it in the grease, are there fats inside of French fries? Yeah, it comes out of the potato, right? Well, you don't see them floating on top because what has the oil essentially done? It's, absor it's absorbed it, right? So the fat and oil is dissolved into the grease. How many of you have grandmothers or parents that after they cook bacon or cook french fries or something like that, they pour it into the little cup and, they, and, the, and what does it do over time? It solidifies. So all of that grease and fat was dissolved in that hot oil over time. Go ahead. All right, because here's what happens, and I, my, my grandmother did this. Uh, God bless her soul. What happens is the more you use it, the more concentrated it becomes and the more flavor it has. You hear people talking about the more you use a grill, the more flavor the grill gets because it's, it's cooked into it. It's kind of the same concept. You have all those flavorings that, sh that remain in, in the grease. Yeah, you basically scoop it out like butter. I know it's gross. Put it down. It's, and, and they really say, like, if you cook bacon, my mom does this. When she cooks bacon, she saves the bacon grease. So when she cooks any type of green, like a pea or a butter bean, you put a scoop of bacon grease in it, and there's something about it. But you don't even have to salt the peas. Like, the, the natural flavoring that just kind of absorbs itself. It's all about flavoring. But... 
Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Hang on. Yeah. So this is just a little humor. So uh, the little ion says to the big one, I just love hanging out with you, chloride. He he, sodium. Oh, no. Is that water? What? Where? I'll never forget you. Okay. So getting dissolved can be traumatizing. Now, let's start with what this actually really means. This right here is what specifically? This is sodium chloride. This is an uh, this is an ionic bond, right? Okay. This is a salt ionic bond. Well, water comes in, and I have referred to water as this before. And I help you may have to help me spell this. Stop. Stop recording. Me. That look right? There are two R's. Google it. Okay, so it is one R. I thought it was two R's. Yeah, these things are ugly fish. Piranha. So water is the piranha. So essentially what it does, you guys know how piranha do. You throw anything in, any type of flesh, it will strip it to, shred it to pieces. This is what water does to a solvent. But here's the thing. We can talk about how cute this looks all day long and it separates it. The key phrase here that we need to talk about is this right here. And this is the AP chemistry part of it. Something called hydration forces. Okay, so what hydration forces are is it's the ability of water to break a bond. Hydration forces, the ability of water to break a bond because our sodium and iodine, excuse me, sodium and chlorine bonded together. The ability of water to come in and snap that bond and separate those two ions into its individual pieces is called a hydration force. Now, hydration forces create solubility. That's totally not solubility. Solubility. Hydration forces create solubility. We could talk about solubility all day long, all day long, but if this stuff did not exist, solubility would not exist either. So simple question. If it dissolves, what does that tell you about the hydration forces? versus the bond strength. Hydration forces are stronger. So if you want to add this somewhere, I think this may be a good thing. So the HF, if it is greater, <laughs> cannot believe I'm fixing to write this. Yes. It would be in science. Hold on, Justin. Justin. To break a bond. Let me, let me write the opposite of this. I'm still working on it. Hydration forces. So HF is hydration forces, BS is bond strength. Bond strength. Yes, same exact construct. Peyton, please. I'm, we're in class. If it's does, if it's an aqueous solution, because I want you to think about it this way. Can I take a substance and heat it up and it dissolve? Not necessarily dissolve, but can it break apart? Can it decompose? Same exact concept, but it's the temperature, the energy is great enough to break those bonds. We're talking about simply solutions. That's what that's our main focus is a solution, a solute versus a solvent. So what Mason asks is important. I know we're talking specifically about water, but can alcohol and oil have the same kind of concept? So could oil be a piranha for a nonpolar substance? Yes. You and me on that? Can oil do the same thing water does? Yes, it can dissolve those fats. <laughs> sure, if you want to call it that. It's not a hydration force because it's obviously not water, but it has the same ability, 
Trevor. Okay, go ahead, Mason. What are we recording now? Go ahead. How would you find bond strength or def define? Okay, there are tables that list bond strengths. When we get to thermochemistry, we will talk more about bond strengths. Okay, and really, if it, what it really boils down to is how strong is the bond between the atom and the other atom that is that is bonded with. Now, are there individual bond strengths? Yes. And then are there molecular bond strengths? Yes, because each bond has a strength, but what you have to total them all up to figure out the total value. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, sir. Okay. Lots of, that's why I mentioned alcohol is a polar solvent. Yeah, and I guess you probably... My apologies, yeah. Let's make that note. Where I told you to write alcohol, alcohol is a polar solvent. And the oil, and I think you wrote, wrote oil, is the non-polar solvent. My apologies. I should have made that clear. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The compound. Yes, ma'am. The compound is not soluble. Yes, sir. A L C H O L. Nope. A L C O H O L. Alcohol. 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 So, water. Now, this is just kind of, this is a really, like, I like this slide because if you know chemistry, this makes sense. If I were to walk out to the street corner or someone in the post office and read them the slide, they would look at me and probably want to hit me because it doesn't make any sense. So I want to read this whole entire thing, and I never just read stuff to you. But if you can understand this, think about the knowledge level that you are currently sitting in here with. Water. The two OH bonds are polar covalent. Oxygen has a high o, higher, higher, stop, stop, electronegativity, and thus the electrons are more attracted to the oxygen and spend more time there. True or false? Does that make it polar or nonpolar? Polar. Okay. This creates a partial charge indicated by the Greek lowercase letter delta. It kind of looks like that funky looking S, right? Now, if you've never seen me draw this before, I do want to draw it. Some of you have never seen this. I don't draw it like that because that's just a computer version. Mine looks like an S that has the tail touching or an 8 that's missing the top part, however you want to draw it, or a snake, whatever. Okay, so partial plus or partial negative. Now, my question to you is, why is it partial and not completely This word right here means what? Sharing is caring. So it's not 100% pushed away. Do you agree that first bullet? There's a lot of knowledge in that. Do you all know what it means? Okay. The next one. This unequal charge distribution makes the molecule polar. Also, Notice the 105 degree bond angle. The two unshared electron pairs. I know there's a lot there. I want to highlight this for a reason. The two unshared electron pairs. First thing. Electrons always come in pairs. What does it mean to be unshared? They're not in a bond. They're still attached to the, that, that atom. And how many of them are there on water? Two of them are hogs, in quotation marks, and require more space than the shared pairs. That's another interesting thing. When it says shared pairs, what is that specifically referring to? This is referring to the bonded electrons. Shared pairs are bonded. I'll come, I'll come back to you. Thus, the usual 109.5 bond angle is squished, that's real scientific, 
to about 105 to create what shape? Bent. There are two unshared electron pairs associated with the oxygen that make the partial negative charge two negative or negative two partial. Okay? So, is there a lot going on here? Hold that thought. Hold that hold hold that thought. So when I draw water, uh, let, let me actually do it really kind of spiffy looking. Now, obviously, the, which one is, I know they're not the same size, pretend they're the same size. Which one is the bigger one? Okay, this is oxygen. Which one is the smaller one? Hydrogen. And I know it looks like an upside down Mickey Mouse. I get it. Okay, so <laughs> we know that the oxygen is more or less electronegative. Okay, so when we do the electrons, and now here's the deal. This is going to be kind of weird, and you may have never seen this before, but just kind of go with it. You okay back there? What that is, I know it looks like a cross, and it looks like an arrow running through the cross. What? That is true. I don't do arrows. So here's what this means. The point, the point, and this is actually the correct way to do it. Remember how in the past I've done the loop-de-loops? This is technically the proper way to do the loop-de-loops. I think the loops give you more of an effect. But this is kind of what's going on. The point is the direction of the electron movement. Okay. So the electrons are going towards which atom? They're going towards oxygen. Okay. So if the how many electrons is each oxygen pulling towards itself? From the hydrogen. Say it again. One each. Does that make sense? So oxygen pulls one from this hydrogen and one from the other hydrogen. Okay. So because it's pulling both of those in, would you agree that this would be one partial positive and this is one partial positive? Now, the reason it's one is because how many is each hydrogen giving up? One. Why is it positive? It's losing an electron. Another way to think about it, if you give someone something, doesn't that give you a positive satisfaction? Okay, it should. If you have a giving heart, it should. Okay, therefore, the oxygen itself got how many electrons? It got two of them, and it's not full because it's still going back and forth, so it's sharing positive, excuse me, it's sharing, but it's gaining something negative, so it's double partial negative. Yes. Okay, hold that thought. I'm going to answer all your questions. Let me finish. Let me finish. Now, there's something missing from this drawing. How many unshared pair? Two. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make these. Um, I'm going to make them black dots. So we have a pair here, and we have a pair here. And I know I'm kind of, it's really, they really should be equal distance apart, but I put that two parcel in the wrong place. So go back and read that sentence, and there's a word that it refers to these electrons about. It has them in quotation marks calls them hogs. So what that means is what it's really doing is all of this space, these electrons are saying, I need it. Get away from me. Stay away. So instead of those two hydrogens kind of getting more towards, instead of them being able to be a, a flat level playing field, what are these two electrons doing to, to them? They are pushing them away from them, right? Now, I really should have used a different color there, but you get the effect. So what happens is those hydrogens are pushed a little bit further, and what does that tell you about the bond angle that is now between these two? It's 105. Okay? Now, what is the name of this shape? So, let me start back, since I've, now that I'm done, let me start with questions. Dustin. I'm with you, yes. 
Yes. I see where you're going. I understand the hypotheticalness of it. I don't have a concrete, definitive answer to tell you exactly what, what the answer to that question is. I'm going to say this, and I don't think it's going to answer your question the way you want me to answer it. Because the bond, the two electrons in the bond, are locked within that bond, that means they cannot roam as far as the two unshared pairs. So since these two are just kind of free yard dogs, they have the ability to go a little further in their exploration. And because of that free range, it has the ability to push those other bonded atoms away from them. It's not the best answer, but does it make a little bit of sense? Gotcha. Justin. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. In theory, no. But for our purposes, yes. Excuse me. Let me, re let me rephrase that. In actuality, no. But in theory, yes. Sir. No. He's never seen me draw this. I don't know. Do you agree there's electrons in here? Okay, so the oxygen is more electronegative. So this is the loopy loop. Okay, so we have. No. What I was trying to get you to understand when you saw this is that the higher density color of the line means the electron spent more time around that atom. Does that make sense? So this is what I mean by the loop-de-loops. This is a really, really childish version of the of the proper way to do it. But sometimes you need the elementary version to be able to get to this chaos. Okay. And so I would never show this to a, to a regular class because you wouldn't understand half the mess that's going on. But you have the foundation of the loop-de-loops to get you there. Think, of, think about this. Hydrogen only has how many electrons? It don't, it, hydrogen only has one, right? So it has one going back and forth. And every, and whenever, let me erase all this mess. One line right here, Mason. One line, one bond represents two electrons. So high, oxygen already had one by itself. Well, it's going to match with another one. So it's only one coming from hydrogen. It can only share one within a bond. All right, well, let's, let's do it like this. Let's, well, hey, I'm, I'm just going to throw this at you. What if it is? You with me? Now, my question to you is, of these atoms, which one is more electronegative? F fluorine, right? Well, fluorine is the most electronegative. So is the fluorine going to pull from the carbon, or is the carbon going to pull from the fluorine? Okay, so what's going to happen is this arrow, this pointy thing, all four of them are going to go like this. And that's going to represent, so we're going to have one partial negative. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Pa pause real quick. Mason, what if it were a double bond? Two. Yep. Go ahead. How many is it supposed to have? How many does it need to be stable? Okay, so let's start there. Two, four. Okay, this is technically a bond, right? How many is within one bond? Two, two, four, two, four, six, eight. But it originally had six, right? So you're thinking, where did the other two come from? Hydrogen donated one, and the other hydrogen donated another. So it gets its eight. Yes. Uh-huh. 
I like that. No, I'm with you. The this partial charge kind of looks like an S. You only get these when electrons are being shared. You don't you don't get them when it's ionic. Yes, sir. I don't know. Go ahead, Trevor. I'd really like to move on. We've spent 15 minutes on this one drawing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, no. Nope. Okay. All right, so moving on. Here's another little picture that you can look at. That's pretty much what I, what I tried to draw for you guys. Everything that's in that we've already discussed. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Properties of aqueous solutions, and I cannot um, tell you ex how important it is to understand several of these things. Um, water has many unique chemical and physical properties. Fairly low molar mass. What's the molar mass? Very good. 18.02 what? Grams per mole. A high melting point. What is it in Celsius? 100, no. Zero degrees Celsius. And boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius. Okay? Now, this one right here, this is the oddball. It expands upon freezing. This is the weird one. If you went home today and you put a bottle of water in the freezer, the next morning you walk and you woke up and you got it out. What has happened to the container that it is in? It expands. But here's my simple question. Was any more water molecules added inside of that bottle? So what made it expand? Kinda? And what happens is, but let me ask you this question. When you cool things down, what happens to their velocity? They slow down. So you would expect, again, expect as things cool down what happens to the distances between the atoms. You would expect them to shrink. But water actually does the opposite. The way the molecules are shaped and the way the forces act between those molecules actually causes them to gain greater distance, which is why water expands. And that is different than most substances. Water is one of the odd ones that does it. Most things actually contract. The opposite. Um, you say soda? Soda, well, that can will bust. Um, go home, put, put a Coca-Cola in the freezer and see how mad your mama gets in the morning. Leave it in there for a few days. Leave it in there for a few days. Not water. It's one of the few substances that expands. Most things don't expand. I can't come up with one off the top of my head right now. Okay, bye. Yeah. All right, so it's able to dissolve many different substances. You'll rarely find pure water in nature. Now, when it says pure water, that means to uh, deionize or distill because normally there's stuff dissolved in it because it is so polar. Yes, sir. I would, yes, it would. Yeah, if you put like a glass cup, it'll, it'll crack the glass. Okay. Now, tap water contains dissolved materials such as minerals, fluoride, and chlorine and all those things, all those other good things. So, water is the most common solvent. Again, we've already talked about this. Hydration. Since opposites attract, the positive ends of water are greatly attracted to the negative ions in the crystal structure. I cannot tell you how important that sentence is. We've already talked about the polar ends of water, right? The oxygen is which polar end? Negative polar end. The hydrogens are what? The positive polar end. And what causes things to dissolve? What force? Hydration forces. So, solubility. NaCl is highly, highly soluble. You already know this. How do you know that NaCl is highly soluble? It's salt. You pour it in. You stir it up. It dissolves. 
while silver chloride is classified as insoluble. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, that, that's, that word insoluble is a complete and total bold-faced lie, but accepted for its value today, and I'll explain the differences later. Okay? So, which means it does not dissolve. When the hydration attractions are greater than the crystal lattice. Now, I didn't use the term crystal lattice. I used what? Ion or bond strength. Okay? Bond strength. The ion attractions, the compound is soluble. So, simply what this means in elementary terms, the water shreds the crystal apart. But in AP chemistry terms, the reason the crystal is broken is because the hydration forces are stronger than the crystal lattice. Does that make sense? So it swims in and it attacks that crystal and breaks it apart. What happens if that crystal is stronger than the water? It stays intact. Nothing happens to it. Okay? It's kind of like this. If you have a, a dam and you build the dam out of grass and sand and gravel, or you build it out of concrete. Eventually, will the water eat through one of them? Well, actually, it eat through both of them eventually, right? Because water erodes everything. But which one will go through first? The grass and the rock and the gravel, okay? Same concept. Exact same concept. Eventually, the water will break it down. Some things are stronger than others. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going there. So note that the particles are charged ions. Highlight that. Highlight that. I like this part here. Note that the particles are charged ions, ma'am. Okay? It is ionic. Yes, ma'am. Bingo. And that's what this sentence right here says. That notice that these things are charged ions. Now, when it says ions, I want you to actually make this connection. Ions are Full charged, fully charged. So when you separate that sodium and that chloride, the sodium has lost one of its electrons, and who would it look like? Who would sodium look like if it lost one? Neon, right? And chlorine has gained one, who would it look like? Argon. So those are floating around, and what is water doing to those molecules? They are surrounding them and carrying them off wherever they want to go. Okay? It does sound awful, but that's what's happening is the water molecules surround that thing. But I have to ask this question. Why or how, however you want to word it, are the, mo the water molecules able to stick to each ion? Bingo. The charges. The opposites attract. So because you have a fully positive and a fully negative, that water has those partials on both ends. So what part of the water will stick to the cation? Opposites attract, so it's oxygen. You with me? So if we look at it from this perspective, if I've got the sodium, and again, they're fully charged, right? OMG. If I've got this thing floating around, okay, these are your uh, areas of the atom. What part of the water is going to be hanging out with the sodium? Now, don't draw this yet. We're going to get there. Unless you want to go ahead and draw one or two of them, don't draw the whole thing. Okay? My second, if you want to go ahead and draw it, that's fine. Never mind. I should just do what you want to do. What part of the water is going to be hanging out with the chloride ion? Hydrogen. And I know that's not very pretty, but it gets the point across. Again, I want to ask one more time now that you've heard it. You've drawn it. You're going to hear it again. Why are the specific sides facing the specific ions? Opposites attract. Sir. It does. I didn't want to draw fourth. There's, it's innumerable. It's, I know. I was just too lazy to draw fourth. It's innumerable. 
It's completely engulfed. How does that sound? It's completely engulfed. Yes, but I'm, t I'm too lazy. Let me tell you this, and we're going to see this later on. There was a question two years ago in the AP exam that asked about the, the um, dissolving of a solid ion, and it said, draw the barium ion. All you had to write was BA, and it said, surround it with at least three water molecules, and it showed you the shape. It was actually the shape they wanted you to draw it in was actually a mini version of this. It actually showed the Mickey Mouse picture, and it said, draw it around the ion as it would be arranged molecularly. And so you had to take that little image and draw it around the positive ion. So they wanted the oxygen, the, the, ma the mouse face touching the ion. And it said draw at least three. So it tells you if it's a question how many to draw. Now obviously you can't, they just want to make sure you know, you don't just draw one. You draw enough to make it concise. So it'll tell you. And I always say draw at least three. So we'll see that in a minute. All right. So this is what's going on. And this is why I call water the piranha. So, this is a crystal, right? Okay. We don't care what kind of crystal it is. We just know it's a salt crystal. How do we know it's a salt crystal? How do you know it's a crystal lattice? Very good. These are ions. Okay. Now, my second question is, what do we know about the hydration forces in this, with this particular crystal? They are stronger. How do you know? Because it's dissolving, because it's breaking it apart. Okay. Now, notice the pictures at the bottom. The, the anion, first of all, what charge is anion? Negative. What part of the water is surrounding it? The hydrogen. Why? You guys are rocking and rolling. The positive ion is surrounded by the oxygen because they are opposite charge. And what's eventually going to potentially happen to that entire crystal? It will completely dissolve. Is there a point at which it, you may run out of water? Yes. Okay. And that is called saturation. We'll get to that. Okay. Here's another picture. We've got NaCl. This is just kind of a more molecular model shape looking thing. It's got some pretty waters. It's got the chloride and sodium ions. The one thing that I want to point out that I have not spoken about yet is, well, let's go back to this picture because it's a little more emphatic. Are there drastic size differences between the anion and the cation? Yes, there is a potential you may see a question where you have to draw the compound dissolved into ions. If that is the case, and we can say sodium chloride, do you have to draw the ions different sizes? I'm telling you now, keep that in mind. So if you want to write somewhere between these two slides, and it's the same concept here. The anion is larger. Look, look, let's go back. Look on the left. Anions are negative. The positive ones are cations. Make sure when you draw, and I'm hint, hint, wink, wink. I can't say it any clearer than that. That when you draw these substances, the anion is obviously, now you don't have to make it 10 times bigger. It just has to be obviously larger. When you draw the water, is there a size differential within the water itself? And it's still an amazing fact, is the anion, the oxygen, larger than two hydrogens? Yes. Okay, so that's why. We cool with that idea? Very good. Uh, no, it's different. A hydrate is a solid that has water molecules that have been um, saturated into the compound itself, not the solution saturation. Now, let's take a look at this again. So my question to you is, is the drawing atomically, molecularly, microscopically correct? So let me ask you this first. How do you know which one's the cation, which one's the anion? Which one's larger? The chlorine. What part of the water molecule is facing the, uh, the chlorine? Is that correct? Yes. Chlorine's negative. Hydrogen's positive. What is the smaller blue one? It's the cation. It's sodium. What part of the water is facing it? The oxygen. Now, so these people, actually a chemist must have drawn this because they drew it right. Does that make sense? So before we were laughing at it, he, he, ha, ha. 
now is there an actual real realism to this? There is, okay? It's amazing what you can learn from a um, from a cartoon. All right, so we've been talking about polar substances this whole time. So let's flip that switch because I've already thrown the curveball at you. Now we're just going to hit it out of the park. Water can dissolve non-ionic substances. Now, when it says non-ionic, that just means it's not a crystal, right? Can it be a covalent compound? <laughs> What's the opposite of ionic? Covalent. So if you want to write something up here where it says non-ionic, you can put covalent in quotation marks or parentheses. Alcohols and sugars. Those are all carbon-based things. Now, so if we were in college chemistry, what kind of class would that be? Organic chemistry. Alcohols and sugars are organic things. They are covalently bonded. But water can still dissolve them. Can you make sugar water? Can you make alcohol water? Yeah, but you can't buy it yet. Okay? So, alcohol... <laughs> you better not be buying it yet. I'll put it to you that way. So... I'm going to cut this off to say this. Contain... O8 bonds that are polar just as the hydroxide bond in water. So the polarity makes the molecules uh, soluble. So here's what we want to talk about. This right here, and I love this picture. Here's my first question. This is digging real deep for you guys. What is the prefix for that organic compound? The prefix. The organic prefix. Come on now. Eth, thank you. Eth. Now, because it's eth, we know, remember, one carbon is meth, two is eth, three is prope, four is bute, and then five goes back to pent, hex, hep, all that good stuff. So there's two. What? We've asked that question. I don't know. So F. Now, because this is an alcohol, and this is visually, I need you to grasp this. The reason we know that this is an alcohol is it says it in words. It contains a what? Does it have a hydroxide ion right there on the end of this thing? So because of that fact, this thing turns into an alcohol organic functional group. So here's, have you taken AP Bio? You did functional groups in the biochemistry part, right? So you recognize this. You've got carboxyl, you ketone, ester, ether, all those things. Okay, you all know what I'm talking about. So because of this is an alcohol, it's eth because of two, and this turns into eth anol. My AP bio people, correct? Okay, very good. So because it has the hydroxide, it ends in anol. So this is eth anol. Is this something that is consumable? Okay, I wouldn't. Okay, but... Again, it's the uh, it's we're going to talk about this is this what's in your gasoline in your vehicle. <laughs> now, hold on one second. I'm going to answer your questions. So here's the deal. It says right here specifically this is a polar bond. So if I take this alcohol and pour it into water, first of all, this is what you get at the gas station. Is it 100% ethanol? If it were, you'd be flying to the moon. Okay, it's 10% or less because it's such a powerful combustion product. Right? Remember combustion? Hydrocarbons plus oxygen yields combustion reactions. So what happens is when you drop this stuff into water, can water come into this region and break that hydrogen? Yes, and that's what happens. Okay. So when water attacks this hydrogen, what's it going to do? It's going to snap that thing off. And it's going to pull that hydrogen off and it's going to engulf it. It's going to surround it. Okay. Now, then what happens to the rest of the ethanol without the hydrogen? This, this oxygen is hanging out there with what kind of charge? A negative charge. Well, what there, guess who comes flying in to hook up with it? What part of the water? The hydrogen. So you're seeing that? So this is alcohols. Sugars do the exact same thing. Eventually, yes. What is it? 
<laughs> that is kind of funny. Now, so this is alcohol. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Jamila. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Two carbons. The prefix, yes, you count the carbons. The prefixes are solely based on the number of carbons. If I added another one to the left, it would be um, propanol. If I added another carbon to the left, it would be butanol. Prop. Prop. Propanol. All right, now, this next part, if you actually want to draw a line, um, this is basically a completely separate topic. This just happens to be on the same page. But fats do not dissolve in water since they are nonpolar. So this is where you can write, or you can circle this thing where it says like dissolves like, but we don't want to talk about that. What is it really talking about? Polar and polar and nonpolar and polar. Or nonpolar. So when we talk about fats, we need to refer to oils. So if you take cooking oil, you can get it to dissolve it. We've already just had a discussion about french fries and bacon. Makes you hungry, doesn't it? Okay. All right. So there's three major words on this slide, and they're in blue, green, and pink, or purple pink, whatever you want to call that color. So blue, green, and purple pink. Saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated. I don't, what color would y'all call that purple pink? Is that fuchsia? Fuchsia. Or magenta. I like magenta. Okay. Now, here's what this means. There's a point at which all of the water is using itself. Like there's no water left to make any more, to dissolve anything else. So all of the water is literally surrounding an ion. That is when you have a saturated solution. It cannot hold anything else. If you take a sponge, stick it in water, you pull it up, what is, how would you define the sponge as saturated? It can't hold any more water. So a saturated solution means it can't dissolve anything else. Does that make sense? Now, so the opposite of that is what is unsaturated. It's a half wet sponge or a dry sponge. It can continue to dissolve. Well, the last one is where it gets really weird super saturated. That means it is beyond saturation point. And here's what it is not. And this is what people always get this confused with. They think super saturated means that stuff is floating at the bottom, which means that you put way too much in it, right? So if you took sweet tea and you put way too much sugar, you stir it in, it can't dissolve no matter what you do. That's not what this is. A super saturated solution actually has everything dissolved, but there's one thing you have to do to it to get it to absorb it. What do you think? What kind of energy? Heat it up. Okay. So near super saturated, out to the right, write the words requires heat. You got it. Well, think about this. This makes sense. When when you want to make sweet tea at home, what do you do with the water? You boil it. Well, then you put the tea bag in. No, hang on. Let's let's kind of talk this out. Let me let me coach you through this. The reason we put the reason we heat it up is because when that hot water hits that tea bag, does the tea leaf need some sort of energy to extract the caffeine and the tea flavoring out? Because if you just put it in cold water, yeah, it'll do it. But is it as efficient? No, so you heat it up to get the tea leaves out. Not only do you heat it up to get the tea out, when you pour the sugar in, what does the hot water do versus cold water? It dissolves it quicker, okay? It's faster. You heat them up, speed them up. Well, the same concept here. If you pour all that sugar in and it's sitting at the bottom, what happens if you take that water and you put it back on the stove and you continue to stir? Will eventually all that sugar dissolve in? Yes, okay? Now, if you make sweet tea, and I've learned this trick a long time ago, and it used to drive me crazy because as a young, as a young kid, my mom always did it. If we ran out of sweet tea, it would take three or four hours to, for the tea to, to cool back down after she figured after she did So when I got in college, I said, I'm going to outsmart the system. You know how you make it, you pour it in, you fill the pitcher up with water, and you put it back in. Don't put tap water in it. Put ice in it. Put ice in the tea. Before you fill it up, because the pitcher's not full, why would you put ice in it? 
it cools it down as you stir it. And what's the, what's the ice going to do? Melt and be water. And you can instantly drink it. You can instantly drink it. The, uh, yes, he put his hand in. Yeah, if she, I wish she was still in her show too, but I'm gonna find it. Yes, with what? I don't drink that crap. You're not American if you don't drink sweet tea. Okay. <laughs> okay, Southern. I'll go with that. Solubility. Now, listen. This is important. This is the last thing. We'll we'll stop. We're almost out of time, aren't we? Oh, wow, we, we do have 12 minutes. All right, so solubility. Guys, shh, shh, very bad. Okay. Solubility is defined as an amount of substance, a solute, that dissolves in a given volume of a solvent. And here's the key part, we've already talked about it, at a given temperature. So when we start talking about the solubility of substances, is the temperature very critical to that statement? Yes, and we're normally going to talk about salt. Like I can hand you a book, and you can flip to the back of that book at the appendix or the index, and you can look up the solubility values of certain solids, and it's going to all of them be based on a certain temperature. It's normally going to be 25 degrees Celsius, um, but we'll look at all that. So um, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to pick back up here tomorrow. I'm going to pick back up here tomorrow.